Hi everyone, my name is Anita Sharma, and I welcome you all on Importer Media once again. Being a professor of entrepreneurship and an entrepreneur myself, I always wanted to learn different tools and skills which could help me solve critical and complex problems. I was looking for such type of solutions, and at the same time, my friend Dr. Pawan Soni was busy penning down his thoughts and experiences from three hundred design thinking workshops. in a book form he published his first book in 2020 design your thinking and this was exactly what i was looking for tools techniques and skill sets and mindsets required to solve critical and complex problems talking about dr pawan soni who is an innovation evangelist by profession and a teacher by passion he started a company called inflection point which is a consulting company during his phd program from iim bangalore The company offers various programs on design thinking, strategic acumen, and consulting skills. Uh, Dr. Pawan is an engineer from MBM Jodhpur and an MBA from UT Mumbai. Let me welcome Dr. Pawan Soni. But before moving to him, I request all of you to please subscribe to the channel and also don't forget to press the bell icon. So, Pawan, welcome to Inkpath Hub Media. And I have seen a lot of things uh, you are posting on LinkedIn and Facebook, and I'm following your work. It's pretty interesting to see uh, the kind of work which you are doing. You are you have been a researcher, you are a consultant, you do a lot of design thinking workshops. Tell us more about your journey so far. Tell us more about it. Yeah, yeah. So it all started when I was at NITI Mumbai, where I was doing my industrial engineering program, which uh-huh. was in two thousand and three. and that's where i sat in one of the lectures by professor bhasin and introduced me to this very fascinating concept called innovation which i wasn't aware of and obviously innovation wasn't a topic uh, which has been discussed extensively in our education system even today so i was quite fascinated by that and the first real break which i got was in my winter internship so niti where i was studying in bombay there is a very unique concept so they crash the learning cycle from about say 20 months to 16 months and they give you four months of solid winter internship mm-hmm. apart from the summer internship which is about two and a half months there is also a winter internship that runs from january all the way to april of your second year so technically you are out of the business school in december itself so there is one semester short and i was looking at internship opportunities by then i had already gotten placed with wipro so wipro doesn't have the concept of winter internship because it's a very unique construct niti had so i reached out to one of my seniors who used to work in titan and i asked him that do you have any opportunity he said yeah you can come but you might not get paid for what you do and i said okay cool because it's just a matter of four months and i went there so that was the very first time i came down to bangalore from bombay it was in the january of 2005 Five, yeah, exactly. Sixteen years back, when I first landed in Bangalore, and I had to report at Hosur, which is where the factory of Tanishk is. So I went there. I was completely lost, did not know what to do, and that's where somebody spotted me and gave me a very trivial project. Uh, looks trivial to me right now, but at that point in time, was quite significant. And this was on benchmarking exercise. So I had to do some benchmarking of various startup group companies, Titan being a startup group organization, and I was kind of uh spending my time there and that's when i got spotted by this gentleman by the name bv nagraj and he assured me into this journey of innovation one thing led to another thing and before i even realized i was preparing a project report on bringing a innovation system and innovation setup a product innovation setup at titan watches division of titan and in the month of may i was giving a presentation to mr bhaskar bhat who was the ceo of titan and the entire board of directors so for a uh you know 21 year old it was a high in my life and you end up making a presentation to the ceo and the entire board of the organization and soon after i left my internship duration and joined wipro and that's where in wipro also my luck was strong and i got spotted by some real senior leaders within the organization once again innovation clicked and in the same year i got a chance to sit in another meeting with mr azim prem ji mm-hmm. later in that particular year 2005 so i think one of the real boosts that happened in my career was this accelerated visibility and adoption of design thinking and on the sidelines always used to read and write a lot 
So one of the gentlemen out there in Wipro spotted me, who was a part of the innovation group. His name is Vikesh Mehta. And he kind of poached me from one division to another division. And that is where I found real calling in life, which was at innovation. So I used to conduct workshops for internal teams, go out at all the IITs, sometimes at other engineering institutes and go and deliver those lectures and talks on innovation, conduct workshops. And what I really owe to Wipro is liberty. They gave me enormous amount of freedom to go out and experiment tremendously. And that's where this thought came to my mind that why not do a PhD program? Mm -hmm. If I'm so passionate about innovation, why not really invest, put food where your mouth is? And that's where I applied to various institutes. Incidentally, I applied to only one college in India, which is IIM Bangalore. I didn't apply to any other college because I was of the opinion that if I had to leave Bangalore, I might as well leave the country. Mm. and go abroad and study. So I applied to a bunch of institutes abroad, didn't get through. Uh, in Bangalore, I had an interview and it turned out to be a pretty fascinating interview. And I got through I am Bangalore. And I, I pretty much knew that there is one person I need to work with. And the person I had in my mind is Rishikesh Krishnan. I knew him for a very long time. And I thought that if I have to work with somebody, he has to be the person. And that's why I joined the institute. Mm -hmm. He obliged, he became a PhD professor. He gave me a problem to work on, which was on innovation. And I think that's where it cemented my interest and my sort of credibility in the space of innovation. I wrote some research work, went about doing my PhD, went to a lot of organizations, spoke to them. Somewhere down my PhD program, I realized that it's maybe too early in my life and career to be a full-time faculty. So why not start something? And if I'm in the city of Bangalore with so much of education, and years under the belt, it might be useful to start a company. And in the middle of my PhD program, I started my company. So if you look at my career in the middle of my, you know, Wipro tenure, I started the PhD program in the middle of PhD, started my sort of uh, consulting company. So I was defending my thesis and running a company at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, and my guides did not know about this because I don't know if they would have been taking it in the right spirit, perhaps. <laughs> okay. So I built that credibility, built the client base before my convocation had happened. And over the last four years now that the company is running, I think it's a fascinating journey. I'm very excited because I'm really able to put all of my research work, all of my practical experience into what matters. And then one fine day, somebody from Penguin reached out mm -hmm. saying that, hey, we read your blogs, we read your articles, we have been seeing like what you said right now in LinkedIn, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So this gentleman from Penguin reached out saying that, would you be interested in authoring a book on this topic? And I said, why not? Mm -hmm. So they asked for a book uh, sort of uh, proposal, which had one chapter and the entire table of content of the book. I gave them somewhere in the month of June last year. Mm -hmm. It took them one, one and a half months to come back to me. We signed a contract. And that's when I started working on the book. Uh, and then pandemic happened. So I had to submit my book by February. So from August of 2019 till February 2020, I wrote one lakh words. That was a wow. cutoff for me. So I had to write one lakh words in parallel to my consulting work. So I had to travel and then come back and write. And I had long nights, uh, night outs in the sense, worked that. And I gave my book to them on in February, one lakh words. And that's when the pandemic hit. And I thought, why not revise the book? Hmm. So from February to August, Hmm. I reduced the number of words from 1 lakh to 90,000. Okay. So it took me from August to February to go from 0 to 1 lakh and from February to August of this year from 1 lakh to 90,000. Oh. And believe me, that last 10,000 words reduction was the most fascinating part because I had to really sort of pick and choose what to let go, what to retain, you know, what to trim, etc. And I think it was a blessing in disguise. Because I didn't have to travel at all. I sat at my home with all the books around me. I could keep myself grounded, focused. And thanks to my wife, Nimisha, uh, it really helped enormously mm -hmm. that she disciplined me. Mm -hmm. So I think it's been a it's been a lucky drive. That's all I can say. Mm -hmm. it's, I've been so tremendously think, uh, lucky. Uh, here, uh, two things I can easily see a synergy. One, uh, you worked with Professor Rishikesh Krishna and I... I, I actually owe a lot of things to him another thing is pandemic for you and in fact for me it worked very well because a lot of people are cribbing about the uh, 2020 uh, but I think uh, it worked really as a blessing for 
people who are writing reading and um, who are yeah. academicians and scholars like you so that's that's really a amazing journey you have told tell me more about this book uh, design your thinking and how yeah. do you separate from design thinking so uh, tell sure, me sure sure yeah in fact i have the book right beside so this is the book design your thinking been published by pangolin random house now this book uh, is partly serendipitous because i didn't i never thought that i'll write a book on design thinking hmm. however for a very long time now i always thought that i would write a book on innovation culture okay but it so happened thanks to folks at stanford university david kelly tom kelly and a whole host of my clients who asked me to do workshops on design thinking and over the last 15 years or so i have been privileged to do close to about 300 workshops on this topic of design thinking alone and that's where i thought that why not pen down my experiences what are the struggles organizations face when they solve problems using design thinking what happens next i do a two day program and i come out of the workshop what happens mm-hmm. after that particular two day program how do people take these uh, essential elements to the execution stage and that's where i pick this particular topic up which is design your thinking mm-hmm. so it is not about designing something like a physical product or a process or a service but it is about designing your thinking Mm. can you think more systematically can you think more creatively and in this book i talk about a whole host of tool sets skill sets and the most importantly mindset so that you can be an expert problem solver mm. and you can be pretty much anybody you can be an entrepreneur like yourself you can be an employee working in a large organization uh, you can be a student who envisages to do a very good project you can be a homemaker you can be pretty much anybody but the whole thrust of my book is how can you be better problem solver what i've also tried to do in this book is bring in a lot of indian context hmm. because when we talk about design thinking intuitively people associate design thinking with the western world there are a lot of cases from apple ideo ikea amazon of course microsoft nike about design but in india we somehow do not have enough cases so one of the attempts i have made in this particular book is to unearth some of the very interesting cases from india ranging from companies like fab india to cafe coffee day titan tanishk big bazaar big basket tata motors royal enfield wipro infosys and trying to bring that indian context that indigo etc bring that indian context at how indians do innovate what we need to do more often is to celebrate those innovations so it's been a humble attempt what i've been truly privileged is that many of my workshops which i've done with large corporates and small organizations that came in handy Mm-hmm. so i could bring a lot of practical relevance thanks to the engagement with all these organizations as well as my phd work thesis mm-hmm. on the space of psychology technology management uh, sociology economics uh, human resources organizational behavior etc so mm-hmm. i think uh, the timing could have been right this is where design thinking as a concept is picking up i got a real solid 8 9 months to focus and work on this book and i think uh, with the new year i'm i'm really seeing a good traction on this book so i'm looking forward to even you reading this particular book anita yeah for me it is like a blessing because um, as a part of my entrepreneurship course i keep a small section on design thinking so uh, when i read your book i'll definitely incorporate that content and uh, how we can design it for uh, the startup ideas which we have so one immediate impact i can Im- see that it is for entrepreneurs so who should all other segment read this book so tell me more about it like who should read other than uh, students and entrepreneurs Is i think it- the the working executives would benefit a lot uh-huh. as a manager and mm-hmm. i don't necessarily talk about the leadership level but as a manager your job is to solve problems mm-hmm. that's what you do as a living mm-hmm. to solve problems but many times what happens is you are so perplexed with the sheer size of a problem or the sheer number of problems that you are not able to solve them permanently so you're mm. almost hopping from one problem to another problem to another problem and if you look at it you are not even hopping from problem to problem you're hopping from symptom to symptom okay. and that's where what this book advocates is instead of hopping from one symptom to another symptom and not being taking time and effort to address the problem permanently why not channelize your energy into picking those problems which you can solve better than anybody else mm-hmm. and you can solve almost permanently mm-hmm. so i think the biggest uh, constituency that will benefit from this book of mine would be the working executives 
so that they can be better problem solvers so that they can institutionalize a mechanism of problem solving which is not ad hoc which is not common sense driven which is reliable repeatable scalable and if we can move away as indians from our jugaad approach of problem solving to something which is more elegant so okay. that's been the singular thrust of this book of mine so okay. working professionals if you will would benefit tremendously is what i feel mm-hmm. from this particular book okay so interestingly i happened to come across a quote when i was researching about your uh, uh, book and uh, the content in it so this quote is mm-hmm. very interesting which reads as uh, design thinking is an essential tool for simplifying and humanizing what are your thoughts this quote is given by uh, john colco yeah that's right what are so your i i refer to john's work as huh. this fascinating quote and i refer to john's work in my book as well Now John has been one of the pioneers in the space of innovation and the quote which you are referring to is from his article at HBR so mm-hmm. he wrote a piece on HBR and that's where I also borrowed a lot of his insights so what he's trying to say is that think of a black box at the input of the black box is a complex problem okay and we are looking at problems which are increasingly getting multidimensional complex and a simple example is inoculation of covid-19 vaccine Mm. if we have to inoculate 1.3 billion indians mm. in a matter of one year or three years it's a very complex problem mm. it's a problem which has the dimension of logistics supply chain cold storage security identity authenticity black market and hence forth and so on reverse logistics of the syringes it's a very complex problem identity because it has to be administered twice in a gap of 28 days is a very very complex problem now a complex problem cannot have a complex solution because the problem with a complex solution is that complex solution is not scalable mm-hmm. so a complex problem needs to have a simple solution like an elegant solution so the black box which sits between a complex problem and a simple solution is design thinking so what john talks about and many others advocate is that design thinking allows you to first of all understand the problem in its complexity mm-hmm. instead of breaking down the problem you takes a systems view Mm-hmm. where you look at the problem in its totality and then chisel out that out of these problems which is the one which is the most significant one to solve and then focus your attention to solve that problem prototype and test if you have really managed to solve the problem and then scale it up so i think with this thrust on empathy and iterative learning mm-hmm. design thinking is a significant departure from how we have been used to solve problems previously mm-hmm. so design thinking takes a complex problem on the input side on the output side it gives you a simple solution so many other solutions for example if you look at the mangalyaan mission mm. we had to put the mangalyaan and we use pslv polar satellite launching vehicle which was not suitable to launch that particular trajectory so what did we do we took a very simple approach that we made the satellite revolve around earth for six times that's what isro did and after revolving around earth six times we had enough thrust to kind of put that into the martian orbit what nasa did is they had to have a very powerful rocket that can put it straight into the martian orbit we didn't have that resource mm-hmm. but we improvised so all these examples are tried to bring to this book to reduce the threshold of creativity and what i really want people to understand from this book of mine is that hey i can be creative anybody can be creative if people get that confidence that yeah i can be creative regardless of who i am i may be a student i may be a homemaker i may be a diet person i can be a babysitter i can be a, a social welfare worker i can be absolutely anybody but i can be creative hmm. that's what i intend to do with this book and wonderful so i'm very much excited to get the copy of this book i would have uh, i wish i would have gotten your uh, signed copy but maybe sometime later but i ordered it on amazon it will receive it will be there uh, with me maybe by tomorrow evening so i'm very excited to receive my copy now so uh, pavan so you have been recently recognized among the top 100 digital influencers by your story how does it feel uh of course it feels good but more importantly it's a it's a acknowledgement that when your uh, when you are faced with challenges you need to adapt that's very important because if i look at my several years last 15 years or so i have been traveling voraciously especially after my phd program which was in 2016 over the last 4 years or so i have traveled so much that almost every week i was out of bangalore mm. 
in some city or the other and i used to think that the dominant way or perhaps the best way to influence people is to have physical conversations with them giving lectures talks workshops etc what this pandemic forced me to do is to adopt a digital medium more mm-hmm. extensively mm-hmm. and i used to write an article almost every week i used to write for ht mint your story people matters entrepreneur magazine inc 42 medium my own blogs articles uh, etc and, and inflection point newsletter etc and that pushed me into exploring the digital medium extensively and that's a reaffirmation of the fact that yes you can really influence people using this very massively accessible medium as well i was just only reading it yesterday in one of the books written about azim prem ji that uh, new york times has close to 5 million subscribers on the digital platform whereas just about 800000 subscribers on the print medium 5 million on digital new york times and 800000 which is not even a million on the print medium if ny times is moving lock stock and barrel from the print medium to the online medium i think that's where the future beholds mm. and it is very important for all of us to have meaningful content that's very very important because i always believe that your your content is more important than your contacts many times as entrepreneurs as business people we believe that if you have right contacts you will get your business but i think and i strongly believe in it that if you have the right content you will get your contacts content would and would remain the king there's no have, doubt about that i am experiencing what you are saying so it means a lot to me actually mm. content is very very important so if i write something i need to ensure that it has been very well researched mm. i try to bring something interesting something which is uh which doesn't only catches attention but also educates my audience and with this recognition i think it only bolsters my uh belief on the importance of content on and on the importance of discipline of writing i think it's very very important to have the discipline of writing had i not been writing extensively initially my term papers at iim bangalore uh and then articles in various magazines newspapers etc i don't think i would have managed to write one lakh words mm-hmm. i don't think it is possible mm-hmm. and moreover y- your ability to revise that content as stephen king very famously said and i quote that you need to learn to kill your darlings right it's a very very uh, bloody affair <laughs> but you need to learn to kill your darlings so if you write a paragraph with so much of a pain and love and emotions and if the editor says ain't happening Hmm. you need to learn to take that page out period hmm. and uh, professor rishikesh krishnan used to always tell me and i wrote a chapter in my book and he said to me that, that it doesn't matter whether you took 6 months to write this page or you wrote it in 1 hour hmm. if it cannot go it cannot go hmm. period hmm. it doesn't matter that's a sunk cost so i think writing is is a great way of disciplining your thinking hmm. that's what i'm realizing you don't write so much for others as much as for you so that you can think more clearly you can crystallize your own thinking and i think this recognition is is an reaffirmation of the fact that i should write more and i should explore every possible medium available to me to be able to evangelize uh, innovation and creativity so that's how i would like to put it up so do you have a habit of journaling not so much journaling my uh, emotions but definitely journaling my thoughts Okay. I I have this compulsion that if I read something I need to put it down into some artifact in the next 2 3 days. Mm-hmm. It's very very important for me to do that. So I put that sort of obligation. And from where you get all these energy to do so many things around? Actually I don't do so many things. If you think about that, I get energy because I channelize energy. Uh-huh. Because I believe all of us have only finite energy. which means you need to pick the things which you would be absolutely sure that you can make a significant impact on mm-hmm. focus is is very critical so i i chose early and i don't regret those choices mm. choosing family choosing health and choosing evangelism which i'm trying to do if i can make an impact on these three dimensions my family my health and evangelism i think i'll be pretty happy mm-hmm. I'll be so blessed what, I can say. What's your message to budding entrepreneurs? Okay, lovely question. So three core messages if I may. The first is let us reflect on the year gone by. Mm-hmm. 
uh-huh. though we are not out of the uh, situation completely uh-huh. in the foreseeable future as well but one thing that the year has taught us comprehensively is the importance of taking risk you cannot be placid for a very long time you need to learn to take risk now risk doesn't mean that you you go out driving at 200 kilometers an hour on the streets risk means choosing an area where you have a competence mm. and going all about throttle full throttle into that area we need to take risk that's mm. very very critical the second thing is you need to learn to focus mm. as youngsters we often believe that we can change the world you can change the world but you can change the world in one particular domain one particular dimension choose the dimension i was lucky enough to have gotten this insight at a very young age and that's where i could channelize my energy and as a result could do something meaningful but at any age if you get a choice to make a uh, make a big impact in a dimension choose a dimension it's very very important so the first thing is take risk in life the second thing is be focused in life and third important thing is invest in yourself mm-hmm. it's absolutely critical to invest in yourself i tell you what before this book went out in the market i was penning down my second book Mm. that was very important for me because i had that time with me when i wasn't having many workshops and i have so sort of waiting for the book to go out and see what happens to the book i was almost uh 10000 words into my book number 2 10000 words i have not got a publisher yet because i haven't solicited publishers based upon the success of this book maybe penguin can give me another chance i do not know about that yet but the key is to invest in yourself you need to learn voraciously mm. you need to keep your axe sharp at all times it's very very important so take risk in life be focused and invest in yourself mm-hmm. invest in yourself in everything not just intellectually physically invest in yourself because you would like to have a long life but not a life in which you can't perform well that's very very critical Correct. invest in relationships few few relationships so investing in yourself taking risk and being very focused which also means saying no mm-hmm. you need to learn to say no to a lot of things in life So I read it somewhere. I read it in this book called Essentialism, and he says that in life, either it is, you know, yes with an enthusiasm, or it is plain no. Mm. There is no indecisiveness. Either you are really going about it full throttle, or you are saying no. Mm. It's not happening. I ain't happening, and that you don't regret about it later on. So I think if I can leave my audience with this message, and if they can play hive to it, I, I think I'll be terribly happy with that. Awesome! Awesome! I wish you all the best for your second book Thank as well. So much. I'm waiting Thank for you. it to come as early as possible yes. now. And uh, good luck and stay safe, stay well. Thank you. Thank you so much. much. Thank you. I appreciate that. Take care. Take care. Bye. Press the bell icon on the YouTube app and never miss another update.